All right, tonight our friends from the Seneca Park Zoo are here. We have Tim and Doug. Doug, correct. All yeah. right, Tim's Tim's the one that's not hiding. Tell us about <laughs> Doug. <laughs> uh, Doug here is a southern three-banded armadillo, a small species of armadillo that can be found in places like Bolivia and southern Brazil. Okay. Wow. So they're not the ones that would be n normally in the U.S.? No, good thinking, the, yeah. though. Uh, there are armadillos which live in the United States. Those are called the nine-banded armadillo, and they're all named for the number of n uh, bands that they have in their armor here. You'll see that Doug has one, mm -hmm. two, three bands that work like a joist to help him close up his armor. The nine-banded has nine bands altogether. And that's kind of where their name comes from, then, right? For many of them, yep. Mm -hmm. what, what is an armadillo? That's a really great question. Uh, armadillos are actually called, are part of a group of animals called xenanthrins. Oh. Xenanthrins include armadillos, sloths, and anteaters. And they're all animals that have strange joints, especially in their back. For instance, you'll notice the armadillo has strange joints, including the bands, but his whole spine is going to have these extra joints that help him to use and uh, develop his shell here. Oh, very cool. Now, let's talk about their habitat. Sure. Yeah. What do you tell us a little bit about this guy? Absolutely. So oftentimes he's found in really uh, humid areas, but sometimes he can be also found in dry areas. Uh, most of his habitat's actually going to be right on the edge of rainforests. So not usually into the deep rainforest itself, but on the edge or in spaces between rainforest pockets, especially dry scrubland or marshy wetlands. All right. Well, now there's many different kinds. You you, you talked about the one that's. Uh, prevalent in the U.S. Mm -hmm. in this one. How many types is there all together? There's approximately 20 different species of armadillo, although depending on which biologist or conservationist, there is a little bit of conversation still about what classifies as different subspecies or species. Mm -hmm. But about 20 altogether, uh, and most of them, or if not all of them, are found in Central and South America exclusively. So nowhere else in the world can you find armadillos. Okay. Now, go ahead. Yeah, I was saying, this armadillo is curled up in a ball. Can they all curl up in a ball? That's a really great mm -hmm. question. Very insightful. Uh, not all of them. There's another three-banded armadillo, the Brazilian three-banded, as opposed to our southern three-banded friend here. Uh, and it can also curl up completely into a ball. No other can curl up completely, but almost yeah. all of them can at least hunker down or roll up slightly mm -hmm. using their shell or uh, covering themselves better with their shell. All right. Now, what's this guy eat? Oh, primarily insects, actually. He's an uh, incredible insectivore. So he's okay. got very few molars that don't have an enamel on them, but they're peg-like, and they help him to mush up a lot of the different uh, termites or ants that he might like to eat. Mm -hmm. And he uses this incredible sense of hearing and sense of smell. If you look at just how much uh, space his nose takes up on his face here, mm -hmm. you'll see that he has a huge nose, and he can find the trails that ants and termites leave behind, uh, and then use these great claws up here in the front to start yeah. taking them out. I was going to ask, how does he eat? I see those mm -hmm. claws there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so he's got these claws. He'll find where the ants, termites, or grubs are, uh, undig them or unearth them using these incredible claws, and then he <laughs> slurps them up with a long sticky tongue and chews on them with those molars. Wow. wow. Now let's talk a little bit about human impact on this guy and other armadillos. What what are humans doing? Well, humans oftentimes will have a really negative impact in places mm -hmm. where animals like these guys live. Uh, unfortunately, one of the biggest causes of uh, loss of life for armadillos is going to be incidents or road accidents. Well, uh, yeah. Their great defense mechanism, <coughs> curling up into a ball or hunkering down in a ball, uh, works really well for predators, but not so well with automobiles. It doesn't get them out of the way in time. So mm -hmm. oftentimes they're found as roadkill. But even so, there's other negative impacts that we have. In fact, a really big one right now is loss of habitat mm -hmm. as farmland encroaches on those marshes or rainforests where the armadillos mm -hmm. live, oftentimes they run out of places to live or farmers don't like them unearthing their crops to get at the grubs yeah. underneath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I see you say armor. Does that armor actually protect them from predators? And from nearly every predator, actually. Okay. So like with many adaptations, there's a little bit of an arms race between <coughs> prey and predator species. Uh, so he has this really incredible bony shell that covers his whole body when he curls up all the way. Uh, and it can protect him from nearly every predator, with the exception of some who have really great adaptations, like jaguars. Actually, mm. I picture teaser from last time. Mm -hmm. uh, the jaguars have an incredibly powerful bite and a really large jaw uh, gape, yeah. it's called. Uh, so they can sometimes, with time and patience, use their jaws and get around the armadillo and eventually crush the shell. Oh, okay. Fortunately, the shell is also really good camouflage. So if he just stays still or uses his ears or nose to detect the predator before it gets there, he's oftentimes protected before he even needs the shell. Ah. You know, and you, you, we talked earlier that he's a mammal. Mm -hmm. and, you know, if you look at the shell, you may oh, yeah. look reptilian, but here we can see the hair. And let's talk a little about 
Absolutely. They... So he is a mammal, and he actually is a placental mammal. So mm -hmm. they're not going to come out of uh, eggs or yolk sacs or anything such as that. Uh, and they're not marsupials either, so the, uh, like a, an opossum or a kangaroo. Mm -hmm. So they don't hang out in their mother's uh, pouch or in their father's pouch. Uh, so their offspring will be born, and for the first few weeks, they'll hang out with their mom, uh, drinking her milk and slowly developing. But they're born with these shells, actually. The shells are quite soft until they slowly get a little bit harder. Probably makes it a little bit easier to bear. Mm -hmm. um, but he does have these hairs. For him, it does help a little with thermal regulation but especially it works as a bit of a sensor. So if there's a prey or excuse me, a predator nearby, he might be able to keep his shell open just a little bit so these hairs stick out. And if a predator gets too close, he can snap close like a steel trap, yeah. uh, scaring or startling the predator. All right. And you talked about thermal regulation. Mm -hmm. How does, uh, now these guys like warmth. Let's talk about what does Doug do here in the winter? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. So he definitely likes the warm. And you can see he's actually shivering just a little bit to keep his yeah, extremities a little bit warmer. Mm -hmm. His favorite temperature is right around 80 degrees. So he's actually quite comfortable here in the uh, uh, lights of the stage, mm -hmm. uh, but his extremities get a little bit cooler. Uh, we actually spoke once about uh, the duck and how the duck has special veins to help to make the sure that yeah. exactly yeah. he actually has the same adaptation in his arms and legs, so that his legs and arms will actually be much cooler than his body temperature, so that no matter what thermal fluctuations happen, all of his organs are staying the correct temperature. Uh, that does mean though he needs to shiver, and as soon as the temperature drops beneath 80 degrees, so he's oftentimes moving around a lot, eating lots of bugs to keep his energy up, so he can shiver to keep these extremities warm. Very cool. You, you mentioned loss of habitat. Is mm -hmm. there anything that we can do? to support what's Absolutely. Going on with There's a whole lot of things that we can do. Actually, one of the best things we can do is eat a little bit less meat. A lot of the beef, especially, that we get comes from farms around Central and South America, which are growing in those same habitats where he's losing his habitat. So if we all eat a little less beef or meat, there's a little less demand for it, and maybe there'll be fewer farms in those areas. Okay. I can afford to eat a little less of everything, too. <laughs> oh, yeah, me too. Well, thank you, Tim. Thanks for uh, bringing Doug on with us. Absolutely. Yes. All right. Now, what if you want... Go ahead. <laughs> if you want, want, to, want to know more about this animal and others like it, go to our website, homeworkhotline.org, and click on the videos. And stay right there. We'll be right back in a second.